good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? It's awesome to be in his presence. David, the psalmist said, there's no place I would rather be than right here in your presence. He said, I would rather be a doorman in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. That's how powerful it is to be in his presence. All right. I, I also want to just uh, say that this morning we're going to have a little bit of a different service. Maybe it works very well because uh, as you saw, we've got some chairs on the, on the stage. We're going to be talking a little bit about the vision that we have for Plight. But before we get there, because I know some of you are failing to listen to the pastor, you're wondering what's happening here. But um, just hang in there. We, we're going to have a conversation just now when we talk a little bit about the vision of Plight and where we're going as a church. But before we get there, I really sense that I want to share a, a short word with you that's going to prepare your heart for the season that we are in. This season is a very critical season. Um, when we understand seasons, it's important to know which are the critical seasons, the seasons that everything changes. And I think this is a turning point for us as a church. And we need to make up our minds that we're going to be a part of what God is doing. I want to say to you that the church, the church is the hope of the world. You have to believe it. The church is the hope of the world. No one else can save the world. It's the church. And some of you are saying Jesus. Yes, but Jesus left the church on the earth. He says, I will be in you and you will be the hope for the world. Christ in you is the hope of the world. How many of you know that right now there is gross darkness that is covering the whole world? But in the midst of that deep darkness, God has called you and I out of darkness so that we can be a light in the darkness. And so the hope for the world is not coming from a presidential election somewhere. The hope of the world is not coming from some government system somewhere. The hope of the world is vested in you and I. The hope of the world is vested in the church. That's why for me, when, I, when I'm even on holiday, I want to be a part of a church because I know that my just showing up is making a difference. Just showing up. The church is the body of Christ gathered together. So whether you gathered online or you gathered in person, wherever you are, as long as we gather, we are the body and God will begin to use the body to make a difference in our communities. The Bible says that the, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Which means everybody is vitally important. We need you. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. The head to the feet, I have no need of you. Each one of us has got a part to play. And so when we understand that as a body, we are called to make a difference. We are called to be the light. We cannot make excuses. We cannot sit back and say, well, somebody must fix the world. God left you here to fix the world. It's time for the church to arise and shine. In the midst of the darkness, it, this is the time for the church to arise and to begin to shine. Isaiah prophesied these things. We speak about them. We sing about them. But the time is now. And when God started speaking to me about advancing the kingdom, he says, you have to believe it's now. We can't wait for a time that is coming and the world is perishing. We need to respond now. And we need to respond in faith. The church is God's plan A and the only plan for the world. And this is not an exaggeration. This is not stretching the truth. It is the truth. God so loved Port Alfred that he gave it you. And me. That's his only plan. As he hung on the cross, his only plan was the church. If I can establish the church on the earth, 
the world will be a better place. He laid down his life so that the church can be the church. So we talk about being a remarkable church. We talk about these things. This is nothing. When in the biggest scheme of things, 100,000 rand, 200,000, a million is nothing. Because when it comes to eternity, nations are waiting to be saved, transformed, and discipled by the church. What was the commission? The commission was go into all the world and make disciples. Nations have to be discipled by us. Nations are awaiting you and I to play our part. And we can blame shift and look at the governments of this world. And God is saying, I left, I left you on earth to make a difference. You are the light. So we are the A plan and the only plan. There's no plan B for God. Jesus is not coming back to transform the world. He's coming back when we have taken our rightful place, when we are ready to surrender the kingdoms of this world to him. So where you are in your workplace and you feel like you are insignificant, God is saying, I gave you one talent. Use your one talent. When I come back, I want to see how you have transformed your workplace. I want to see what you've done in Port Alfred because of the one talent that I gave you. Not because of the nine that you did not have. Not because of what somebody else had. It's because of what I gave you. What do you have? Use that talent to make a difference. And that's where we are right now. God is calling us. Um, I, was, I was thinking of John, Jesus saying of John the Baptist, ever, de, ever since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and now the violent take it by force. And God said, it's time for the church to have violent faith. We, we, don't, we don't operate in violence in the physical. It's spiritual violence, violent faith. Where we are not going to back down. We're going to believe God. If God says it, we're going to have faith and say, God, you said it. We want to see it now. And we are going to believe you. We're going to put our faith into action until we see it established on earth as it is in heaven. And that's the challenge of the season, to have violent faith. I want to talk... I want to talk a little bit about a community of believers. The power of a community of believers. That's this community. There's so much power in this community that includes the people who are watching online. The gathering like this has got so much power. And you have to believe it. You know, you kind of think, well, when they have the, uh, the big summit somewhere in Joburg, Pretoria, or wherever the cabinet meets. No, he says the real power is in a community of believers. And we want to talk about that power that is vested in us as believers. Because it's time for us to begin to manifest it to the rest of the world. When you read of the first century church, I must say thank you, Andy, for for ministering last week and challenging everybody to be a part of. Wasn't that good? You need to be a part of the priesthood. That means you can't just come and say, I will sit right there at the back and just observe. You have to be a participator. You come to church and you understand it's not just about the people on stage. It's each and every one of us playing our part that makes the church what it's supposed to be. Amen. All right. So when we look at the first century church, very quickly, I notice a few things. I want to I teach a few concepts from a, script, from a portion of scripture that, you know, most pastors just kind of skip because it's too radical for today's church. Do you want me to go there? Are you guys not afraid of the truth? That's good. That's good. Wait until you hear the truth. You know, the Bible says, you're judged by the truth that you know. Once you hear it, you can't unhear it. <laughs> you were better off if you didn't tune in today. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> God is going to speak to us. I want to talk about a 
portion of scripture in Acts chapter number 4. I really believe that what God is asking of the church in this season is risky. Everybody say risky. I think it was somebody. I might just attribute it to the wrong person. But somebody said, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Risk. Christians don't want to take risks. Nah. I gave my life to, to Jesus so that I can be safe and one day go to heaven. I've secured my ticket to go to heaven. I'm safe. Don't talk about risks, Pastor. True faith is risky. And we see it from the very inception of the church, the first century church, a couple of days after the Holy Spirit comes down, they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And one of their first moves, highly risky. And God started drawing my attention to this scripture. And I realized that today's church has got no idea of what it means to risk everything for the sake of the gospel. The first century church was birthed and they realized that we need to change the world. 120 people, only 120 people touched by the power of the Holy Spirit in the upper room. And they knew that they had to go out and make a difference. And they were so bold, so radical, so faith-filled that a couple of days later, 3,000 people were added to them. And I really believe that we are in the same season because in the midst of the crisis that the world is going through, when we understand the times in which we live, I really believe that there is a, there is a cry from the heavens that where is the church in this season? We need to be like the first century church to begin to believe God for impossible things so that we can make a difference in this world. We need to respond to the gospel the same way the first century church responded to the gospel. You know, the Bible says Christ will not come until the gospel is preached to the ends of the earth. So you can't sit there and say, well, this vision of preaching to the nations is not important. I just want a piece of bread. You're missing kingdom. Am I minimizing the need for bread? No, we're going to talk about it now. That's what we're going to talk about. But we need to have as a church the mindset that says we are called to change the world. We are called to make a difference. And when that sinks in your heart, when you realize that the hope of the world is vested inside of you, you cannot just sit back and relax. You start doing stuff. So in X 4... We see something really radical happening here. I'm going to pick it up from verse 29. Th this is a prayer. Let me give you a little bit of, of, of context. What has happened here is, uh, was it Peter who's been arrested and is coming out of prison and they've been threatening them, don't preach, don't preach the gospel. You cannot preach, otherwise we are going to arrest you again. And, you know, they made all these threats. And this is their response. They gathered again. That's why it's important to gather. You know, when, when you're going through the week, you can be arrested in the course of the week. But when you come on a Sunday morning and you are with your fellow believers and start praying, you start praying from a place of faith. Because out there from Monday to Friday or to Saturday, you, you're kind of doing life all by yourself and it might feel lonely. I think he, he kind of felt a little bit lonely because he was the only one in prison. He was arrested by himself. But when he comes to the body, instead of saying, woe is me, you know, I got arrested. We must be extra careful. You know, this thing is very dangerous. Uh, people are going to get killed. They start making a prayer. They start praying. And he says, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak the word with great boldness. Coming from prison and you say, God, they have threatened us. But because of their threats, enable us to speak with greater boldness. I want you to see the kind of mindset that changes the world. Like we've been threatened, 
But God, we just want to remind you that because of their threats, enable us to have greater boldness. And so they prayed risky prayers. What's your prayer life like? Are you praying just for the slice of bread? God, just bless me. Give me today my daily bread. Or are you now praying risky prayers? God, South Africa is in a mess. Use me. Give me the boldness to make a difference. That was the kind of prayers the first century church was praying. That's what they were saying. God, we know things are not functioning, but use me. Give me the boldness to be the change that my community wants to see. Verse 30, stretch out your hand and heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servants. Two things I want to highlight. Their prayer was, God, you stretch out your hand. But here's what most people miss. They say, through us. That's, that's the biggest, that's the key to making a difference. That's, a, that's the revelation that God is trying to give the church right now. I left you on the earth to be my hands and my feet. Stretch your hand, God. That was their prayer. But they said, through your servants, us. God is not going to stretch his hand and touch the world if you are not available. It's going to be through you. And the first century church knew that. That if we are going to see a revival, if we're going to see reformation, if we're going to see change, transformation, whatever we are praying to see, we need to be the vehicles, the vessels that God can use to touch people. So their prayer was risky. God, use me. Port Alfred is in, in a crisis. Use me. Stretch your hand. I can do nothing. I like this. They were acknowledging that left to ourselves, we can do nothing. But if you willingly stretch out your hand through us, we will do great things. God wants to do great things through you. Those who believe in me shall do great exploits. The exploits are going to be done by God, but it's through you and me. And that's where we need to, we, we, we need to be as a church. God, stretch your hand through me. Verse 31, after they had prayed, the whole place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Again, that boldness. And here was the result. And that's just the portion that I want to draw your attention to. This was the result. After risky prayers, after availing themselves, here's the result. Ah. God, stretch your hand through me. Here's the result. He said, you want to you wanna, you wanna hear the truth? After they finished praying, after they locked themselves in the closet and they prayed, God answers their prayer. And this is how he answered. Verse 32. All the believers were in one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. Are you still saying amen? It's, it's, it's gone quiet in this church. God used me. And God says, well, if you want me to use you, everything that you have belongs to me. Your car belongs to me. Your house belongs to me. Your bank account belongs to me. The clothes you are wearing belongs to me. Everything that you have. And we, we, we're getting awfully quiet now. You, you said you were ready for the truth. They prayed bold prayers because here's the problem. When we are in the prayer room, Thank you, Father. We thank you that Port Alfred is not going to be the same. We jump and we fight and we sing and we dance, we clap. And when we finish, God says, okay, 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 okay. Now let me speak to you. Everything you have is mine. Here's the answer to the prayer. Everything you possess is mine. Stop claiming. Stop holding on to your possessions. You want to see 
change in Port Alfred. Everything you have belongs to the kingdom. There's a little bit of faith somewhere here. No one claimed that any of their positions was their own. They all gained the revelations. We are stewards, only but stewards of the kingdom of God. God has invested in us. He has given us talents. He has given us resources. He has given us time. He has given me a job. That job that you like, that my, I, I cannot because he says, I gave that to you. It's mine. It belongs to me. And so they gained the revelation. Uh, we, we were having this conversation in our financial meeting on Friday. And we were just talking about, you know, we need to plan. And, and somebody in the meeting highlighted the fact that God has been good to us. That in the midst of a crisis, God has continued to supply for us. No one has had a salary cut. Um, you know, the church is looking good. God is providing. And so we were sharing this, this vision of all the changes that we want to do. And somebody said, just a state, a, a, a faith statement. These are the kind of people that are stewarding, stewarding the finances for the kingdom of God. So I'm saying this so that you know you've got good stewards. Somebody said as a st statement of faith, it says if God is giving us, we cannot just build a fat bank account. It's that parable where the man was... You know, he was, he was being blessed and he's like, wow, I better go build bigger barns because, you know, you never know. We are in the year of Corona. You know, you never know. Next year, things might just be in a mess. So we need to, we need to just protect what we have and, and, and build reserves. And the Bible says of that man, you foolish man, you don't know when your life is going to be taken from you. Why are you storing up these things? Why are you building bigger barns? Some of you have been blessed. Hear me, because I, 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 fe I felt that statement in the spirit. Some of you have been blessed, but you're waiting for the bottom to fall off. I was speaking to somebody, they're like, well, you know, this, this crisis hasn't really affected me personally. But you know, you never know. And I'm thinking, God has provided for you, has made sure that you're well looked after, Instead of being generous and celebrating the goodness of God, you're like, God, I just don't know when things could go wrong. I'm going to save some more just in case. And that's the whole attitude that the world has right now. We never know what tomorrow holds. Let's be extra careful. And God is saying, I am your provider. Trust me, believe me. If I've kept you safe now, I know there are some people that have been had seriously affected, and that's why I'm preaching this message. Because the fact that you've been affected, and some have not been affected, is all the will of God. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of those things that people cringe. I think, I think we've become so religious that we feel we need to defend God. God does not need to be defended. You know, <laughs> when you understand that God can allow certain things to happen that don't make sense to you, you stop defending God. I stopped trying to defend God long ago. I, I just like, well, he is God. He is sovereign. He can do what he wants to do. How is it that we are all in the same church? We are all in the same faith. We serve in the same God. One is struck and is really struggling and they really, really struggling. The other one is prospering and they're saying God has opened incredible doors. Is that God is a respecter of persons? No. In his sovereignty, everything works together for good. The one who's been blessed and the one who's suffering is working together for good. So if you have been blessed and somebody comes along your way and says they're struggling, here's, here's the answer. What you have belongs to God. Take what you have and bless the next one. And the, and the kingdom advances, God glory, is glorified. So let, let me get to that. Let me get to that. So verse 33 Oh, let's, let's read. So, all the believers had one mind. No one claimed any of their positions as their own, but they shared everything they had. How many of you know that the Holy Spirit does not exaggerate? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's good. Yeah, you, you had everything and you thought, maybe, maybe the translators got it wrong. 
They shared everything. This was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was not exaggerating. Which means that you might not have a fancy house, but you have a bowl of porridge. You share that. You see, the, the, the problem with the church when we come to these scriptures, we think everyone who was rich was the one who was blessing the others. No, he said everyone had all things in common. The rich person and the poor person had all things in common. The church reads this and they think, well, you are the one who's blessed, so my part is to come and beg. No. You need to go and find somebody that you can bless from what you have. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify of the resurrection of the Lord and God's grace was powerfully at work in them all and they, there was no needy person among them. Here's the conclusion of a powerful, spirit-filled community. When we really understand that all that we have came from God and we are only but stewards, no one will be needy. They're like, nah, the poor you always have. I understand those scriptures. But what he was saying is this. Every need that was presented to the church was solved by the church. And the church of today is like, well, we need, we need cameras. But maybe somebody from the business world must fix that problem. And God says, no, 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 no. Everything that the church needs, every, every need that is presented to the church is solved by the church. It's a community of faith. A community of faith. And when we begin to build this type of faith, when we come together, we begin to believe all things are possible. Not some, but all things are possible. If I read to the end, which is, I'm not even going to teach because I love the scripture, it speaks for itself. There was no needy person among them. Now watch this. Because of risky prayers, the Bible says, from time to time, not once off, from time to time, those who had land or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it in the apostles' feet and distributed it to anyone who had need. How many of you are invested in the kingdom enough to go and say, well, I just felt I was praying and I felt I need to sell my house. Ah, uh, the gospel is God's plan for the world needs people who are not self-centered. I heard that clearly. As long as we are selfish and we're thinking about me, myself, and I, we cannot advance the kingdom. That's the lesson that's here. The kingdom of God is going to be advanced by people who understand that every blessing that I have is not for me to one day take to heaven because I can't. It's for me to make a real difference here on the earth, here and now. Now, we want to give you some practical examples of how we can do this. We felt for a long time that God wanted us to have a community center. You know, we made a, a big attempt on developing a community center and it didn't, it didn't quite take off. Things didn't work out the way we wanted them to work. But all that was also still God's plan and purpose. But what has happened is this year, when we thought of the crisis and we were asking ourselves, what can the church do? We really felt and sensed that this is the right time for the community center to be launched. This is a time for the church to be the church. This is a time for us to arise and to shine. There is a real crisis out there and we need to respond. And so we, we started thinking and we said, how can we respond? And we knew that God called us to revisit the vision of the community center and say, what can we do now that makes a difference in our community? Not just come in to say, well, we sang a few songs and we went back home. What can we really do? 
And so we want to be having a conversation. I'm having a conversation with Tenille. Tenille joined our team last month, 1st of September. Where are we? November. Um, and so some of you have been seeing her involved in what we are doing and you're wondering what exactly is happening. So I'm going to ask Tenille to come and join me up here and we're going to have a conversation and we are going to just share with you what we believe God is asking us to do right now and how you can get involved. Because the answer is not coming outside, from outside. The answer is not coming from America. The answer is not coming from anywhere else. It has to come from the church. And so you and I must open our hearts and get ready to receive from God instruction, practical instruction on how we can make a difference. Amen. Well, welcome to Neil. And um, thank you, Pastor Jay. This is finally happening. And Amen. <laughs> you need to maybe maybe a very good place to start is you just simply introducing yourself to our church and to our community so that they know who you are, why you got here, what what you sense God is doing in your life, and then we'll take it there from there. For those that don't know me, my name is Tanil Carter. And you know, Pastor Jay, when you when you know your identity and your purpose where God is taking you, nothing is impossible with Father. Amen. And I just want to I just want to encourage you today just, just to and I want to bring you back to a journey where I grew up. I grew up in East London and as a little young girl, I was so passionate about working in communities, doing life with with with, with people. And I wanted to know, I wanted to learn more a little bit more about cultures and working with the people and the communities and that. So as a young girl, I went into the communities and I went and explored that option and, and I just loved it and to see working with the broken hearted and just to just to spend life with them, do life with them. And I would go into the communities. I mean my family thought I was crazy. And they were like, what? And I, it's like, I feel I needed to go there. And I didn't know that that was God's plan for my life. I just thought it was normal, something that everybody does. And so when I went into the communities and that, the, the, the children would come out and they would say, Na kom long, which means there's the white person. And they would come out and it would, you know, just something so, so, so simple would come and just want to just thumbs up and shop, shop. And you would just see the joy. You would just see the father's heart revealing in the communities. And for me, that was my passion. That was my heart, just to see father's heart being revealing in the communities. And as a teenager, I would wake up in the morning and, say, and I mean, who as a teenager wakes up? Come on, let's be real now. I wakes up at six o'clock on a Saturday and goes out into the Stuart Street uh, ministry with bread and with a young with, with, with your youth pastor and going out and just spending time with the street children. And for those who know East London, I mean, that was in the Marina Glen. It wasn't the safest of places, but it it was okay because God protected us. God provided. And as a young person. Um, being the age of 16, I didn't know my identity and my purpose that God was calling me. So I thought, as a young person, money is, is always good, you know, I'm going to have lots of money. So I thought that my purpose would be to be a chartered accountant. So I started exploring those options and went in, and I, and I went in and studied, and after schooling, went and studied a Bachelor of Commerce degree. And in my second year, and this is how amazing God is, because in my second year, I, I was called to help out a family who an au pair, a young girl who had cerebral palsy. And I loved doing that. And that family just wanted me to help them and just be a relief for them because it was a struggle um, working with them. So I was helping working with a, young, with a young girl with cerebral palsy. And God used a nine-year-old with cerebral palsy to change my life and to turn around and speak to me because I wasn't hearing him. He was telling me a lot of things that you need to be in the communities. I want you to be a social worker. So he turned around, and that's when I knew my second year of Bachelor of Commerce, that social work is what God wanted me to be, and that was my purpose in life. But he wanted me, I didn't see myself as a social worker, but a change agent, someone who works in the community. And so I, he said, that's your ticket, because I want to take you to unfamiliar places, because I need you to do things, because I have an assignment and a purpose for things, for my glory and for my honor. And for those who know, when you walk into your plan and your purpose, 
things flourish. Nothing is impossible with Father. So I entered into my degree and started off from scratch, Bachelor of Social Work, and I went in. God just made a way with everything. When it came to finances, my father lost his job when I was in third year, and I thought, okay, Father, is this an it? You know. So when I did, um, when I social development came, and they had a funding, it's what is called a scholarship. And I didn't meet the criteria. The father was like, fill in the application. I was like, okay, father, I don't meet, but I'm going to fill it in. So that was two years before when in 2007 when I started my first year. But in 2009, my father lost his job. He was retrenched among 300 people at Dame Chrysler. And so when, 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 when that time happened, social development said to me, here is a scholarship for two years for your, for your degree so you can complete your degree. And I was like, wow, your father, thank you. So he provides and only does he protect. So I, ended in, I went in and I finished my degree, obtained my degree. But you know what? When you do something for the father, the Father just shows more and more things in your life. And so I finished my degree, obtained my degree, but before social development, the plan was after social development, they would employ me as a social worker. So I had to wait six months. So as, so, so as a social worker, I didn't know anything about child protection services, which I knew was the core function, the core focus in social development. So I went to an organization called CMR, which is Christian Social Services, a child protection organization. And I began exploring that option, and, and I spoke to them, and they said, I don't have a job for you, but you can volunteer. And I was like, okay, I'll volunteer. I didn't know where the funding was going to come and how I was going to get there in my daily expenses. But... For six months, God provided, because when you walk into something that God has called you to do, he again, he provides. In those six months that I didn't know, you know, this is how amazing God is, and I say this with humility, is that when I finished my degree, the university had to pay me, because I was in credit with my account. So I was like, that's how amazing Father is. And I was like, your Father, that is your, I was like, are you sure? Are you sure? Did you get your calculations correctly? <laughs> and it's like, no, you're in credit. Yeah, it's your money. And that was God's provision because I went and I volunteered. And in June 2011, social development employed me and asked me to come and, I, and, and placed me in Grahamstown. And Grahamstown, well, those who know Grahamstown, it's not an easy place to live in. But God's like, I need you to go there because I, there's an assignment for you there and things I need to fill. So it was almost a 10-year journey for me in, so, in social development. And so I was working there um, in, the, in, in the organization and began ex and learning things and um, being a generic social worker, removing children in foster care and um, and also dealing with children that are really vulnerable and orphaned. And he said, in this season, I want you to be my Esther. And I mean, when you walk into your purpose, then you know that there is influence as well. There's going to be influence. There's a sphere of influence. So I want you to be my Esther. So I had to go to familiarize myself and go into the courts and, and be that voice for the children, for the families in need, for the brokenhearted. And it has been a fantastic journey, but towards the end of last year, Pastor Jay, I'd say around a, in March, actually, God spoke to me, and I felt like, actually in 2017, I felt there needed to be a change. And this is also how amazing God is, because when I was, I, I went to my boss, and I was in child protection, so I feel like I need to work in non-profit organizations and familiar myself in an NGO. So there was an opening to work in early childhood development program, which we know as your preschools. And so I familiar myself with that program, working with preschools, familiar myself with the MPO Act, the policies and that. But in 2017, I said to Father, I said, Father, one day I'm going to be a center director. I'm going to be a policy maker. And I'm going to be around that table where they're going to be um, talking about the Child Protection Act, where changes need to be happened. And if you look at now, and you look at three years ago, look what God has done. And that is amazing. So I thought last year, I thought, coming to last year, and I thought, there needs to be another change, Father. I feel like there's something more. There's more to life. And Father's like, move. I need you to move. And in the old year, would have been like, oh, hell no, no. I'm not going to move. And there needs to be another job. 
But I took the step of faith, the Abraham faith. And so I thought that, you know, when you hear words and you prophetic words, you know, you, know, you want things to happen now. And I thought, okay, I'm going off overseas. Here we go. It's England. And God's like, no, you're going to put all for it. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. So I began knocking on the doors and seeking opportunities and looking for things. And then until one night, I remember Pastor Jay, I was on the leadership training for Word of Truth. We were on a meeting on a Monday night, and I was still sitting next to Isabel. And we were in a discussion room, and Corrine had mentioned about plight, and was in that moment that the penny just dropped. And, I, and we both, myself and Isabel, looked at each other, and we were like, we didn't say anything, but the penny just dropped. And afterwards, it's like, you need to contact Corrine. And so it was 8 o'clock, and I was like, it's a bit late, but phone Corrine. It's like, okay, I'll phone her. And so I phoned her, and she's like, okay, let's meet the next day. So I met the next day with her, with Corrine and Daryl Ann, and we began looking at, you know, the plots and the way things are going and what is happening, the situation, and did a situation analysis. And the father asked me, asked me to ask them a question, how can I be of assistance? And so I did. So how can I be assistance? And say, well, we need someone to pioneer the organization, to run with it, who has a heart for the community, who is passionate. I said, okay, Father. And so we came here, we looked at the center, and we prayed, and he said, Father, if this is your will, let your will be done. But if it's not, shut the doors. But if it is, open the doors. And that's what happened in the 1st of September. I began the start of my journey here at Clark Community Center. Amen. Wow, quite a story. Um, that's, we, we really knew that the season we have entered into for plight requires a champion. One of the things that we learned from the first attempt of starting the center is that when you do something, you need someone who's passionate, uh, somebody who's committed to the vision, somebody who God has already called to champion the cause. Otherwise, we start something and we don't have this champion it will function for a, little, um, for a little bit, for a season, a short season, but it will not work. So for when I met with um, Duran and, and Corinne and we were sharing and then later on with the eldership and we were talking around this, we knew that the one thing we needed was a champion. And so we found our champion. And so it's good to have you with us. Uh, Thank you, Pastor. And we know that God is going to work in and through you to see this community center develop. So we started talking about the vision, Tamil, and just I, I know this is, a, this is a big vision and we need to uh, really unpack it in, in a different season, in a different time, in greater detail. But just to share with, uh, with the congregation and with our community, there are people that are listening from the community, what plight is looking like? What is the vision? What is the dream? What resonates? Because I remember we, we, we've had a number of meetings where it, it is not just what word of truth is dreaming, but what is God play, placing upon your heart? Uh, what are some of the things that resonate in your spirit now? I think first day, like when, when I sat and um, I really just went down and, and I sat on, on, uh, at the, the center and I said, Father, what do you want? What do you want for the center? And he started speaking and he started seeing the, the vision. And we can go on to the next slide. And he said to me, we're going through a time of crisis at the moment. And each and every one has going through a time of struggle, financial loss. There's loss of families. There's been hurt. There's been heartache. And he said, I want the center to be an ever-present help in times of crisis. And I was like, so when I, when I, when I hear the word, I was like, Father, I need confirmation. And when I was speaking to, to Pastor Justin and in our meetings, he, we, we both came up with the conclusion that we would be a center, we'd be an ever-present help in times of crisis. But God dropped in my spirit that verse in Psalm 46, verse 1, that says, I will be an ever-present help in times of trouble. And he wants to be an ever-present help in trouble, times of trouble. But in order to do that, he needs hands and he needs feet who will hear him walk in obedience. And will, when he says left, they will go left. And when we, he says right, we will go right. So that was your saying with our vision. And when I saw the picture in with the people and the different with the crosses, he said, "We plot means placing life in God's hands together." 
And I just saw a picture of God's hands and the tree of life, but the tree being deep rooted in God's hands of his palm of his hands and us being the tree. And when we deep rooted in father and we place life in father's hand, we can, we're going to go through storms. We're going to go through things and seasons. But, you know, when we deep rooted in him, we will still stand. We will still stand and, and stand firm and, and nothing will happen. So that was us as, in, as the people, the community. I saw a picture. We, we go through times and we go to hardships, but seasons change. But when we firm in deep, deep in Father's hands, nothing is impossible with him. And then again to see a picture of hearts, different color hearts. And that was us from different walks of life, different backgrounds. And us as individuals, we're coming together in unity, helping one another to make this work. And then I saw a butterfly. And when a butterfly changes, it transforms from a caterpillar into a butterfly and it flies off. And that's us. When we be a helping hand, transformation happens. So with a vision, we're going to respond to a crisis. We are about, you can go on to the next slide, Wade. As we, we want to be a multi-purpose center, a center that is providing different services, a center that cares for people, for Fred Alfred, holistically. Because when you look at an individual, we are mind, body, and spirit. But an individual is part of a family as well as part of a community. You cannot separate the, the, all of them. So that is where we're going with the vision. We want to respond to a crisis. You can go on to the next slide. And our mission is to, we want to help serve and support anyone experiencing a crisis in our community, especially those facing a healthcare crisis, an educational crisis, a family crisis, and an unemployment crisis. You can go on to the next slide. So that brings us to the key focus areas. We said we're responding to a crisis. Can I go on, Pastor? So we, we, we looked at the four pillars that we needed to respond to, and that was accessible health care, family transformation center, educational development, and empowerment. And I want you to sit now with me and just vision. I know we're going to ask the hows and the ifs and the whens and hows is possible. But we need to remember that nothing is impossible, Father. And when Father has asked us and when it's in his will and given us the idea, things will happen. Change will happen. So I want you to just vision with me, run with me, because the future is bright for Port Alfred and the best is yet to come. That's good. That's good. Yeah, you know, we, we shared about the pillars before. Uh, there's been a little bit of a tweak in, in the focus of the pillars. But those four things is what God had already called us to do. And some of the things we were already doing, you know. But we really felt, again, that God gave us the vision then to respond to the crisis that we are going through now and going beyond. So if you look at the nation of South Africa, those four areas, um, the real crisis We've got a, a health crisis, we've got a crisis unemployment, we've got an educational crisis, and families, obviously, communities are made out of families, and families are in, in trouble, and we're experiencing crisis. So when we avail ourselves to serve in those areas and say, how can we help? Obviously, we're going to define what a crisis is, um, but the, the reality is our community is going through a crisis, the world is going through a crisis, and the church needs to respond. Exactly. And so when we looked at the four pillars, we can go on to the next slide. We were a center that responded to a crisis pregnancy back in 2007. The center was developed because there was a crisis of pregnancy. So there was pregnancy testings, there were counseling, information giving, there was support, walking with mother and child, who, women that were experiencing a pregnancy crisis to make informed decisions. And we, the father's like, we want that. You can go into the next slide. But we're going to add to another thing that says accessible health care. And I know you're probably thinking, this is huge because it, it also, but when something is in your head and God has given you a vision and you wake up every morning with this strong vision in your head, you know where you're going. You will tackle those challenges. You will tackle those, those things that are going to come along the way. So with accessible health care, it does look like it's something huge. But when I said to Father with the confirmation, I was like, Father, 
Did I hear you correctly? Accessible healthcare? Because we want to link arms with people, the organization to consist us in making this possible. Quality, affordable healthcare to our community, which requires us to have a registered nurse for providing health services to the community. And you know how amazing God is? I was doing a little bit of research around this. We can go into the next slide. And I popped this organization, and he's like, it is possible. This is an organization who has a clinic in the Western Cape, in, Ca in, in Cape Town, in a Delft community, who's very, it was a, a poverty-stricken area, where they have a container with a clinic that's with a registered nurse that's providing healthcare services and pharmaceuticals to, to the community where there's a need. They responded to a crisis. And he's like, that it is possible. I didn't know about that organization, but God showed me that it was possible. It is possible. Amen. We can go into the next slide. But then when we have a crisis, our body gets affected as well as our mind. And so we said to Father's like a family transformation center. We don't want to leave you. We're just helping you with health care services. We want to take you a step further. And where there's restoring our family life, responding because when, as I said, as an individual, you're part of a family and part of a community. We want to support families in crisis, renewing our minds, restoring family health, and a healthy emotional well-being is very important to us at the center. So we want to say to, uh, to, to, we want to see transformation, the renewing of the minds. So we want to say to dads, you are good enough because we want to see you as a provider. We want to see you as a protector for your family. We want to say, moms, you are a good mom because you are a comforter, a teacher, and a nurturer. Mm. And we want to say, children, you are going to have fun. You are going to get education because there is a purpose for you and there's a life out here where the future is bright. So when you start working with people and walking with people and helping them and identify their purpose and knowing who they are, they can go further because they come from here and you walk with them, you can see things change in their life. And if things change in an individual, it's going to change in a family and it's going to change in the community. Amen. So we want to provide care and counseling. We want to equip parents with healthy parenting skills. You can go on to the next line. We want to have support groups. We want to have, be the voice of the child to be heard. In a white way, we want to say, moms, you, we can see that you're worried, you're anxious. Your child is really struggling through this time of crisis, through this time where they don't know where they're coming and going with, the, with their schoolwork. Bring your child. Let's see how we best can help your child. And we said, you're not going to be alone. We want to walk with you. And so when you walk and renew in the shift and the people know who they are, they can go further in life. And you can go into the next slide. So when people know they are and know their identity, then we walk with them further and say, with the children, we want to educate you. We want to help you, not educate you, but we want to link arms with teachers and educators. And we want to say, we want to be a helping hand to the students who are struggling with specific child, equipping parents and guardians to create a culture of learning. And we want to help with reading and writing with children um, who are really struggling with reading and writing with programs. And we have an after-school programs for the children. You can go into the next slide. We envision a computer center that's going to equip our children with computer literacy, providing career guidance. I mean, I know with myself, when I left school, I didn't really know. I, I went out, I chased after the money, to be honest with you. The money was good. You earned 50,000, be a chartered accountant. But I didn't really know I are. So we want to help school leaving children with, with, with career choices. They know where they're, they're walking into, know that they're walking into their God-given purpose where God wants them to be. And so we want to network with other organizations. We want to become a support structure to our teachers and that. And you can go into the next slide. And so that's where we want to take. We want to have a computer center where the children come in and, they, and we equip them with the skill of computer literacy as well as adults as well. So you can go into the next slide. But we're going to take it a little bit further now. We, after you know your identity and your purpose, and you feel, when, when I knew about my identity and my purpose, and I knew where God was taking me as a social worker, social work was my ticket to be a, a change agent in the community. But I, when I went through, I felt empowered 
And I, because when you feel empowered, you flourish, you want to empower other people. So we want to say to the communities, we don't want to leave you there. We don't, we don't want to leave you where you just know your identity. We want to help you. We want to celebrate with you. We want to see you flourish. We want to see you reach your full potential. We want to see you empowered. We want to celebrate with you and walk you along this journey. And that's what we thought our Father was saying to us, empowering people to help themselves, equip people to reach their full potential, developing skills, skills training, and developing a strong work ethic in the people of our community. You can go into the next slide. So in, in that way, people will come up with the ideas and want to start business opportunities. And we also want to say to organizations and to teachers and school principals, we want to link arms with you and help you build your teams, strengthen your, do team building with you, to strengthen your teams as well as in the church with your ministries as well. We want to develop your, and that's when we came up with employee wellness as well as one of the examples. And ultimately, we want to raise transformation leaders in our community. So you see, when people come, they come as brokenhearted. But if a person, and in our community, if the person says, I need help, then we take them further. We walk, you walk with the people along the way as an individual, respond to the body, responding to the mind, and we empower the people because we want to celebrate them and reach their full through. Imagine what an impact it can make in this community of Port Alfred. That's good. That's good. Well. Wow. We can go on to the next slide. So Tanil, the, the thing is, you know, the, the dreaming part is where everybody kind of like, okay, we've had the big dream and the kind of stuff. But the real question here is we're in a crisis now, our community is struggling now. How can we make a difference right now? What do we need? How can this community respond so that we can get involved and start making a difference? You know, Pastor, at the moment, we need to create, our first step is that we need to create awareness in our community. Our community needs to know that there's a center out there that cares about them, that loves them, and wants to see them flourish in life, who wants to see them walk in their God-given purpose to who they are and know who they are. So I would say the first step is to create awareness. Tell the people, tell the community where you are, where you're working, that there is a center out there that cares about them called Plot. Next thing, we feel, we feel in this season that, and we're not going to be a wealthy um, organization we're going to give because we want to develop people. But we want to respond to a crisis. And when you go out and you just touch hearts and connect with people, um, we feel that we want to sow a seed in the community. So we have been given a lot of donations of clothing and things like that. So we really need people to help us to come and box those clothing because we want to sow a seed into the communities and say, we want to bless you. We know that you have been going through trouble and you've lost your job and you've had to cut down on things in your own life. We, we've got some clothing. We just want to bless people and sow a seed in people's life. And we believe in, in that way, we're going to connect with people. We're going to touch hearts. And in that way, you're going to build trust. And the community is going to have your trust. And then we work for, walk further and just say, we're going to, we have services that can help you. We get to hear about the people's stories and we see how best we can help you and respond to that crisis. So when I was thinking, I say, the father said, what about a school uniform drive, a school drive? And I was like, I really need some community people to, and I, we want to, we want to service in people's lives and school children as well. If you have a school shoes, a school shoes and socks and pencils and pens and pencil bags. We want to bless children out there. We want to just bless them with some pencil bags and with pens and pencils and erasers in there. We want to say, my chicks, you're leaving now. And if your school shoes are still okay to go for another year or two, bring them to the center because we want to bless some children with some school shoes. So we want to have a, a, a school drive for kids and just bless the community in that way. 
as a gang, we're not a welfare system, but for this season, we feel Father saying to us, let's sow a seed, let's connect with the community and build each other up so we can implement and come next year, we can implement the services that God wants us to implement. Man, uh, we, we kind of felt that, you know, right now, responding to the real crisis is the issue and everybody needs to get involved in answering the crisis. The only way we are going to raise awareness for the community center is simply you and I getting up and saying, I want to solve a problem out there. Mm. We've had a number of people that have already approached me and said, hey, there are people that don't have food, the people that are not eating. I want to give, how do I do that? Um, and we said, hey, the community center is starting. We want the community to know. Here is a big vision. Here is a big vision. Our God is the ever-present help in times of need. We want the community to know that if you have a need, go to the center and you will find help. Whatever that looks like. But it's bigger than Tenille. It's bigger than Justin. It's bigger than just a handful of us. When we do this as a community, we will feed we will respond to crisis. We will make an impact. And that awareness is going to go a long way to tell our community that we're not just saying we are here. There is real help. I say to Tenille, you know, James says it's not good enough for us to say go and be well. We need to say to a brother that needs tomatoes, here are some tomatoes. So if you want to be a part of this, one of the things, as Tenille is going to highlight now, one of the things is when we bring the little that we have, together we will make a massive impact. And it's no longer you doing something secretively. Uh, you can continue to do that. But when we do it together to lift up the name of Jesus, the community will know if you have a need, there is an ever-present help in Christ. And though... We, we are putting the center out there. We want people to encounter Jesus Christ, and that's, that's the goal. Yeah. Just as I'm closing remarks, you know, you're probably thinking, yeah, that I don't have the expertise. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a social worker. And I don't know what I can help with. But what I want to say to you is that when we come together, God shows us something. And be that ever-present help, I want to encourage you is to stand up and to show Put on your garments that says anointed to serve because we're all anointed to serve. We all have a purpose in, in, in our life. And when we stand and we see the vision where God is taking the center and we see the crisis, we hear what the problem is and we respond with our mouths with transformation and we say, here I am, how can I be of assistance? And we walk further, not just one candle, not just one light of, that's in us, and be a, but many of us, hundreds of us, walking together, being a beacon of hope and a beacon of light, we can make a huge impact in this community and it starts with us. Put on your garments of praise. It says anointed to serve and let's see what God has in store for this community. Thank you. Amen. Thanks, Danielle. Wasn't that awesome? A little bit of a different church service, but here's, here's the challenge. Stand with me, if you will. Here's the challenge. Are you ready to respond? to the real needs that our community is facing. We can talk church, we can pray, we can sing, but if we don't respond to the real issues, we are denying the faith. Faith says, yes, let them come on, bring the stories, bring the issues, bring the challenges. Uh, I remember we were speaking to one of our pastor friends in Delft, the community center they have. These guys, they simply said, we want to avail ourselves to the community. And there's nothing they cannot do. Right now, they have a state-of-the-art communication center that is in Delft, a, a, a colored a community, impoverished community in Cape Town, but they're, doing, they're trading with the rest of the world. 
they do business for the Americans, for the Germans, right in a township. Just because they said we want people to bring the needs and we're going to trust God to solve. When you hear what we are trying to do, you're going to say it's impossible. But what is impossible with God is possible. What is impossible with man is possible with God. Get it right, Justin. What is, what is impossible with man is very much possible with God. And so when we allow people to come and tell us what the real need is, we can bring real solutions because our God is about to make a way. Amen.